number of units the children will leave from prime time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome, and welcome to our harvest service. And it's just wonderful to see uh, so many uh, children up at the front and uh, everyone just crushed in this morning. So if you're visiting with us this morning, then I hope you'll feel very much at home and part of our church family. Thank you to all who have worked to make the church look so well. Our speaker this morning is the Reverend Ivan Nish from Abbott's Cross in Newton Abbey. Ivan, you are very welcome, and we look forward to you teaching us from God's Word. Jonathan and Ivan have exchanged pulpits this morning, so Jonathan is in Abbott's Cross. And as a church family, we have been very concerned over the past days for Gareth and Linda Mahood and their little daughter, Alice. It is with great sadness that I announce the death of Alice Mahood. We pass on to Gareth, Linda, and Eva and the family circle our heartfelt sympathy and assure them of our continued thoughts and prayers at this difficult time. There'll be no details of arrangements until Monday and the home is private. Thank you very much for your, your kind welcome to Greystone Road. Uh, I suppose I'm really here because I invited uh, Jonathan to take the harvest service in Abbott's Cross. So he really didn't have much choice uh, but asked me to come and take the harvest service here. But I'm delighted to be here. I've known Johnny since he was uh, 10 years old. His father used to have a, a project evangelism in Port Rush, and I was on that in 1976 when Johnny was 10. I think he was probably slightly taller then than he is now. <laughs> but I didn't see him for quite a while, and then we met again when Johnny was in, uh, in Ballyneur, and we've kept a friendship since that, and I'm delighted to have him at Abbott's Cross to take our, our harvest service this morning. Um, I am originally, well, I can't say originally from Antrim, but I came to Antrim when I was about 14, and I would consider myself to be an Antrim man. Uh, my family lived here. Uh, for many years. So it's lovely to be with you on this very special day. Lovely to see all the children here uh, up at the front. And uh, James was saying that when you, I had to come in here because then the choir would come in and the children are sitting at the front. So basically, I can't get out at this stage. So uh, trust that God will really bless us together as we, as we worship him and give him our thanks. So we're going to sing uh, very well-known praise, uh, but harvest we plough the field and scatter.
close our eyes and we're going to pray. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and loving Father, we bow in your presence. We come before you with thanksgiving and with praise. We rejoice in your love and mercy to us. We thank you for all the good gifts that you shower upon us. And we bless you for the gracious way in which you so generously give us of all things. And today we are reminded of your goodness in the harvest that comes each year. And we praise you for the mystery and wonder of that event and for all that it provides for us. And we rejoice in the promise that you have made to this world that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will continue. And so, Father, we thank you that you provide for us, that you give us those things that we need day by day. But especially, Lord, as we meet together on, on this your day, we thank you for your goodness and mercy that you extend to us in Jesus Christ. We praise you that you sent him to be our Savior, that he came into our world, that he lived a life of perfection, that he died as a sacrifice and substitute for people like us. And he rose again triumphant and victorious over the grave. And so, Lord, we praise you that we have today one who is able to bring us forgiveness and give us hope and peace. And so, Father, as we meet in this way to worship you today, we pray that you will draw near to us and that by your Holy Spirit, you will be at work in our hearts and in our midst. And we pray that you will enable us to truly seek after you and to draw near to you. For we know that if we seek you with all of our hearts, your word promises us that we will find you and be found by you. So, Father, bless us together, for we pray in the Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Now the choir are going to sing for us uh, their first piece, and it's entitled God and God Alone. Here, if I could only read it. Thank you very much. <laughs> God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw it, that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning on the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. 
livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our, in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food, and to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move in the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Lily, Ben, Eve and William, is that right? Thank you very much, that was really super. And now the choir are going to sing for us God and God alone. Yeah. 
you very much indeed. We're going to be hearing from the choir again on another two occasions, so thank you for that. Uh, we're going to turn to God's Word now. We're going to read from John's Gospel and chapter 6. So let me encourage you, if you have a, a Bible with you, if you'd like to turn to John 6. I see it's on the screen, so you don't need your Bible. That's all right. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. Amen. And we give thanks to God for his word to us. Now, boys and girls, I don't know whether Mr. Moxon normally comes down to the front, but I maybe just stay where I am so that I don't maybe stand on anybody down there. Okay, can you see me all right? Because I can see you. Now, I have something here that I, I left in the minister's room, and James very kindly went away and got it for me. Now, this is the harvest. Okay? Now, that's why all these different things are around the building. It's the same in Abbott's Cross. You don't normally have those. Sure you don't. And uh, what we're doing today is we're especially thanking God for the things that he gives us, the food that we have, and we see them all around us. Now, I've got some things with me this morning, and I'm just going to see if anybody likes these. Now, who likes oranges? 
All right, some of you don't like them. There's a few faces being made here. Some of you don't like oranges. That's okay. Who likes tomatoes? Not too many like tomatoes. You'd much rather have the oranges, wouldn't you? Apples uh, as well. Who likes apples? Oh, everybody. Most people like apples. I love apples. So apples are very popular, and so are oranges. Tomatoes, not so popular. And here's one other one I have. Anybody know what that is? What is it? It's a lemon. Hands up if you like lemons. Oh, I don't like lemons. You take a bit of lemon in your mouth and you go, oh, they're very bitter, aren't they? And they're all different. They're just like us, aren't they? They're all different. Different shapes, different sizes. They look different. They taste different. Just like us. We're all different, aren't we? All of us are made special. But here's the thing that I want to ask you this morning. See, I wonder if you could tell me the answer to this question. What is it that all of these fruit have that is really the most important part of the fruit? Not maybe as far as we're concerned, but as far as as far as the harvest goes. Who can tell me what is inside all of these that is so important? Yeah? Seeds. That's right. In all of these fruit, there are seeds. And those are the most important things about this fruit. And you say to yourself, well, how did all these things come about? Where did the apples come from? Apple trees, don't they? But how would you get an apple tree? If you wanted to have an apple tree, what would you do? Yeah? You'd plant a seed, wouldn't you? You'd plant an apple seed, and an apple tree would grow from it. If you wanted an orange tree, now you couldn't do it in our country because it's too cold, but you would plant an orange seed, and a tree would grow from it. The most important part is the seed that's inside. And boys and girls, I want to say this to you before you go out to your own program this morning. You see, you and I are all different. We all look different, and sometimes we're very concerned about how we look, aren't we? We like our hair to be nice and wear nice clothes. And, but the most important thing is inside us that you can't even see, because it's about our hearts. Now, I don't mean the bit that goes boom, 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 boom every second or so. I mean the part of us inside that loves things and wants things. And in there, God wants us to love him and to want him more than anything else and to give our hearts, our lives to him. And when we do that, then we have the life that God wants to give us. And that's what matters more than anything else. So I hope you remember that we're really grateful for all the things that God gives us, the lovely harvest that gives us food. But you remember what's inside all of these. It's the seed that matters most. And God, he doesn't really mind so much what we look like, how big we are, small, or whether we're dark-haired or light-haired or whatever, he, mar he, he, he is concerned most about whether we love him and trust him and belong to Jesus Christ. So I hope you remember that. Now, let me just check. Uh, we're going to sing, uh, we thank you, Lord, for all your gifts, and after this, then you're going to go out for your own special program. Okay?
Now John Eccles is going to come and speak to us about the harvest offering. On behalf of the Mission Support Group, I'd like to tell you how the harvest offering will be used this year. It's a straightforward split. 50% of the offering will go to the property fund to help ensure funds will be available to maintain the suite of buildings. 50% will be distributed between the six mission groups you are supporting. And just to remind you, they are CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship, Romania and Moldova, Tear Fund, The Reed Family, Asia Link, Dublin Christian Mission and MRF, Middle East Reform Fellowship. Now we've decided how the funds will be spent. I think it's time just to still our hearts and minds and just pray for these mission groups, or at least some of them. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that mission has been placed on the hearts of your people here in Greystone. Father, you know what has been done in your name and as a result of your prayers and the generosity of this congregation. Lord, we pray that we be able to continue this work in your name and to your glory. Father, we thank you for last Sunday morning service, where we learned of the work undertaken by our CEF summer camp team, and we were touched by the message brought by Claire Bain. We pray, dear Lord, that your word will continue to be heard by the children of Romania and Moldova. We bring before you in prayer the Reed family, that each day they will be guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring glory to your name. The Reed children are always in our thoughts and we pray that each day they will grow in their knowledge of you and have the joy of knowing you in their hearts. Father, we give thanks to you for the spiritual growth in the churches in the Nuruk region of Kenya. We pray, dear Lord, that you will work in the hearts of the Maasai people, that many will believe in you and be changed. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be in at work in all the mission groups we support as a congregation or as individuals, and your kingdom will grow as you have planned. These prayers we bring to you in the name of our Saviour. Amen. We continue to worship God. The offering will be received.
Our Father, we are truly grateful again for the privilege and opportunity of giving to the work of the gospel. We thank you for all that you've given to us, and we recognize that we simply return to you that which you have entrusted into our care. We recognize that all that we have is only for a time, and we pray that you will enable us to use what you've given us in a way which will be a blessing to others, which will be an investment in the kingdom of God. So, Father, we want to commit our gifts to you, and we want to ask that you will give wisdom to those who have stewardship over them. And we pray that you will enable this congregation, this fellowship, to use those gifts in a way which will be pleasing in your sight, which will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ, and which will extend that kingdom and be a blessing to your people. And Father, we are very conscious as we give these gifts to you that we are frail and fallen and we are sinful and we ask your forgiveness. We pray that you will cleanse us afresh and we thank you that we have one who is able to take away our sin, one who died the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to you. And so, Lord, we praise you that you even give us a desire in our hearts to worship you and to give these gifts to you. And Father, we know that in giving them we do not enrich you, and withholding them we do not make you poor. And we pray that we might uh, be pleased to use our lives in a way which will tell not just for time, but also for eternity. So accept our gifts, and we pray that you'll bless us together. And as we turn to your word, we ask, Lord, that you'll open that word to us, that it will be a word in season for us and will speak to our hearts and cause us to love you afresh. And we pray in the Savior's name. Amen. Now the choir are going to sing again. Uh, Ten thousand reasons. Oh, 
you very much indeed. That was really lovely, and we're going to hear from the choir again before the end of the service. Now, I believe that uh, when Mr. Moxon does his sermon, he has his computer here. Uh, well, I don't have my computer here, but I believe there's somebody at the back that's going to operate for me, so I'll, I'll give a wee signal when I want my, uh, uh, my slide to change. So maybe we could, we could, we could start off with a picture on the screen. I uh, read an article on one occasion uh, about a 25-year-old uh, attractive young lady, and she'd entered into a marriage with an 85-year-old man. And she said it was purely and completely and only for love. Now, you read on and you discover that this man was a billionaire. And you then at that point become a little bit teensy-weensy suspicious, don't you? And you say to yourself, was there an ulterior motive? Now, as far as I'm aware, in the particular case concerned, that lady did not have very long to wait to receive her inheritance. Uh, but she said it was for love, and yet looking on, you're really not sure. Now, sometimes we do that with people, don't we? We say, I know why he did that, or I know why you said that, or I know what you're thinking. Wives are great at that. They know what husbands are thinking. My wife knows what I'm thinking, even when I'm not thinking it. <laughs> it's true. She knows things about me that I've never discovered. She says, I know that you don't like that. <laughs> That's amazing. I never knew that myself. <laughs> but the truth is, you see, that none of us know what is in another person's mind or heart. That is the privilege of our Creator God. And whenever Jesus Christ was on the earth, because he was the Son of God, there were times when he was able to say, I know what you're thinking. And that's exactly what happens in John's Gospel, chapter 6. We're going to look at this little incident between Jesus and the crowd who come to see him. Now remember, just before this, he has fed 5,000 people. And then he withdraws from them, and they're looking for him. They don't know where he's gone. They don't know how to find him. And eventually, we read uh, in verse, uh, the, the, the end of that chapter, 24, the crowd realizes that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. They get into the boats, and they went to Capernaum in search of him. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now, it's at this point that Jesus uses his knowledge of their minds and their hearts to talk about their motives for coming to find him and to redirect their attention to something completely different. And I want to draw your attention to the reason these people came. The reason these people came. Now, they're desperate to find Jesus, and they eventually do. Now, we would imagine that that was a good thing, wouldn't we? We would say these people have seen his miracles. They've heard his messages. They believe that he is special, that he's unlike anybody else who ever walked upon this planet. And they want to find him. They want to have his company and to hear his words. Surely that's a good thing. But we discover that that is not their motive. Let me read verse 26 to you. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw the miraculous signs. So he says, it's not because you're amazed at who I am and you want to be with me. But, he says, you are looking for me because you ate the loaves and had your fill. So in other words, it wasn't that they were astounded at the mighty works of Jesus and wondered, could this be the Messiah? We need to know more about him. The reason that they wanted to find him was because they'd had a free meal along with the other thousands of people. They had eaten their fill. It hadn't cost them a penny. And they figured if they stuck with him, if he'd done it once, he could do it again. So they were driven to find Jesus Christ by a desire for more bread. In other words, they followed him for what they could get from him. 
Now, you and I can be guilty of the very same thing today. Our interest in God can be prompted when we have a particular need. We can turn to him when we want something from him. Now, it is entirely possible that most of the time God has little to do with us. Oh, we may believe he's there. We may come to church on a Sunday. But the rest of the time, we look after ourselves. We're quite independent, and we can get on well without God. But the crisis comes, the emergency happens, and we feel helpless. Our backs are against the wall. We are desperate for help. And then we come to him. And often we will pray and we will plead with God and we'll make promises to him. We'll say, look, I'll go to church more often. I'll read my Bible more regularly. I'll give more to God's work and to charities. We tell him what we're going to do with our life. But the truth can often be this. We only want him to give us what we so desperately need. You see, the important thing is this, that God knows our motives. He sees our hearts. He's not fooled. And God is aware that we are trying to use him to get what we want. We're not interested in him. We're interested in what he is able to give us. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if people treated us that way? You know somebody and you say you only hear from them when they want something off you? Somebody takes a phone call and says, it's so-and-so, and you say, what does he want now? Or you see somebody coming up to your door and you say, what's she after? Because you only hear from them. You only see them. Whenever they want something from you. Wouldn't it be terrible if we treated God in that way? As we come together today, we give thanks for the harvest, and rightly so, because we are abundantly blessed. Let me ask you this question. Does it go beyond the harvest? Does it reach to the giver of the harvest? Or is it just about bread for the stomach? Now, we see the, the reason why these people came but you know there's something deeper because we discover also there's a mistake that these people made and Jesus tells them he says in verse 27 he highlights this mistake he says do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life So you see, the fact that they had come to find him because they had got bread and they wanted more bread, that was really a symptom of their hearts. Because the focus of the lives of these people was on earthly things. They were absorbed with the here and now. Their thoughts and their time and their energy were taken up with the physical, and that was their big mistake. Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils. Don't invest yourself and make that the be-all and end-all of what you are. Now let me just stress, of course, that Jesus is not saying that we are not to work. He's not promoting laziness. He's not saying we can lie back and let somebody else take care of us. Work is part of creation. Adam was told in the garden that he was to work. And if we can work, We ought to work, and we should do it with all of our ability and all of our hearts. But what Jesus is saying is this. Make sure that you do not allow bread, earthly things, to dominate your life. Do not set your hearts on the physical and temporary. Why? Because it spoils. They're fading. They're temporary. They're fleeting. Time will separate us from them. We'll be here and we'll be gone and we'll leave them all behind and they're passing. 
Now the philosophy of many people today, and you see it in the media all the time, is this life is about possession and things. Nothing else. Now let me say this. Bread has its place. Physical, earthly things have their place. And don't be going away saying, looking at those pictures and saying, the man says we're not allowed to have a nice car or a nice house or jewellery or a nice holiday. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. Life is more than all of those things. <laughs> Bread has its place. But we're to ensure that that is not all we have that we're not absorbed by the here and now. You'll probably know the name of John D. Rockefeller. If you've ever been to New York, you may have visited the Rockefeller Center, which is built in his name. It's a massive edifice in the center of New York, 850 feet high, 70 stories, and it's named after him. John D. Rockefeller. He was a great businessman. He developed an industry that was sur surrounding the whole uh, supply of energy and oil. At one stage, it was estimated that Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. Now, of course, Rockefeller was human. And eventually, the day came, I believe it was 1937, when he passed away. Somebody who was close to him was speaking to the accountant who was winding up all of Rockefeller's financial affairs. He said to him, tell me this, off the record, how much did John D. Rockefeller leave? His accountant looked at him, thought for a moment and said, he left everything. He left everything. Does it matter whether it's millions or just a few pounds? Does it matter whether we have a skyscraper in honor of our work with our name on it? Or whether we just have a headstone that says when we lived and when we died? You see, the vital thing is this. There needs to be another aspect to our lives. Let me ask you this question. As we sit here in this worship service, with Judgment Day honesty, as you do your job, and as you raise your family and pay your bills and provide a home, is there something else to your life? You've worked hard, and all your energy and all your investment has been in the here and now. And if you were called away from this scene of time, you would have nothing. It would all be left behind. And all the tributes and all the obituaries would only be about material things. Or can I ask you this question? Is there a heavenly dimension to your life? Are you making the mistake that these people made? Jesus said, do not work for food that spoils wouldn't it be a terrible mistake if we had plenty and an abundance maybe for a few years and nothing for eternity? We need to heed the warning of Jesus, the mistake that these people made. And then the last thing I want to draw your attention to is the response that Jesus asked for from these people. Notice what he said. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So what he's saying is this. The focus of our lives, the emphasis of us as individuals, needs to be that which endures to eternal life. You see, you and I are made in the image of God. Now, I don't know what your scientific convictions are. My background is science. Do not let anybody tell you that when you see a little slug on the pavement on the roadside, that you and that slug have the same history. 
Isn't it amazing that people tell us that? If you've heard of the Human Brain Project, it's going to take place over 10 years. It is going to cost £1 billion. Pounds. And many of the world's best scientists are going to be involved in this. You know what they're trying to do? Effectively and essentially, they're trying to discover how the human brain really works. And people tell us it came from nowhere, and with nobody involved, it has become everything. It's absurd. And people who believe that find it hard to believe that they are made in the image of God. That's why human life has dignity. That's why people are so important and special. The stamp of God is upon us. We are not just very clever, highly developed animals. When you look at the world around us, there is the whole animal kingdom, and then there is a massive gulf, and then there are people. And you and I have qualities within us that only are found in God. We understand right and wrong. We're morally accountable. We can love. We can create. We can have community. All of those things are found in God. And we are made in his image. And we are made for a greater purpose than to have a few years here. And to eat. And to have. And to build. And if that's all that we do, we are wasting our lives. We're not just bodies, we are living souls. We're made by God and we're made for God. And eternity stretches out in front of us. And we need to work for that which we can take with us. We need to ensure that in all of our ambitions and all of our goals and all that we strive for, that we are fundamentally paying attention to our souls, that we have treasure in heaven and that we are rich towards God. Well, how do we do that? What does it mean to work for food that endures to eternal life? How do we go about it? What do we have to do here? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Now listen to this. Which the Son of Man will give you. So Jesus Christ is the source. It comes from him. It's to him that we must go if we are to have that which endures to eternal life. That's where it all begins. Now listen to what they say. What must we do to do the works that God requires? Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, the Son of Man will give you that which endures to eternal life. And they say, what do we have to do? Tell us the works that we must engage in if we're to have eternal riches. And I know people today, I meet them from Abbott's Cross Congregation, and they believe that to have that which endures to eternal life, they must do something that they're not doing. They must try harder. Got to be a, a better person. They've got to improve themselves. They've got to be nicer. They're not doing enough. And God says to them, you've got to try harder. Well, let me tell you this, the good news is, and I'm sure you've heard it from this pulpit many times, the good news is, it's not about working. It's not about getting up the ladder. It's not about striving to reach higher. Listen to verse 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. We can almost... See them stretching forward to hear what he's going to say. This is the work of God. All right, we're going to hear it now. The work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. That's the work of God. That's where it starts. It's in coming in faith to Jesus Christ. To be joined to him. 
It's about giving our hearts to him. That's where it all has its beginning. Listen to what one wise old commentator said. He said this, Faith in Christ as our only Savior is the first act of the soul that God requires of a sinner. Until we believe in Jesus and rest on him, we have not made a beginning. Faith in Christ, he says, is the root of saving religion. It begins with him. And it goes on the same way, doesn't it? Jesus is calling us to come to him and then to live a life of faith. To show our love to others. To worship God in our lives, in our families. To serve him. To share the good news of the gospel with others. Throughout all that we do and all the necessary tasks of work and home and family and community. He says to us we should be working for something greater. It begins on Christ and it continues with him. I can remember... When I was a young person um, at church in Antrim, uh, we used to go on our Sunday school excursion to Portrush. That was so sad, wasn't it? Today you go on an excursion to, to Lanzarote or somewhere like that. We used to go to Portrush. Sadie Murphy organized our, our trip. We went on the train. A train that went on coal and steam and smoke. But anyway, you would always try and bring something back from Portrush to those that you cared about. And the one thing that we regularly brought back from Portrush was Portrush Rock. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine bringing somebody back Portrush Rock today? They would look at you. But the important thing about Port Rush Rock is this. That at the end of that rock, when you, when you looked at it this way, it said Port Rush. And when you turned it around the other way, it said Port Rush. And when you broke it in the middle, it said Port Rush. Wherever you broke it, you found Port Rush. And what Jesus is saying, wherever we look at our lives, or to find Christ. And where our hope is, what our goal is, what our priority is, what we aim for, what we long for, who we serve, and who we live for. We're to work, we're to strive after those things that have an, equal, an eternal quality. We're to be sure that we're investing our lives in them. Seeking the kingdom of heaven. So as we raise our families, as we use our gifts in the church, as we're prayerful, as we heed God's word and seek to be generous and to reach out, we're working for food that endures to eternal life. So let me ask you, what about, what about you? Don't like people point the finger at us, sure we don't. Don't point your finger at me. I used to be a teacher and sometimes children would say that. Don't point at me. Well, God wants to point at us. And I want to ask you this question. Are you working for bread that endures to eternal life? Are there riches in your soul? Do you have an eternal investment? Remember, Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So how is your spiritual account? Have you opened it? By believing in Jesus Christ. Is it healthy or is it empty? Jesus said, verse 33. He said, I am the bread of life. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He gives life. Some people, you know, believe that if they come to Jesus Christ, their lives will be over. That he will take away their fun and enjoyment. That he will spoil life for them. He will cramp their style. He will keep them down. And it will be the end. Let me tell you, it's the opposite. 
As somebody who lived far from God for 24 years of my life, I can tell you that is not true. He gives life. If we're created by God and we're created for God and we live without him, then it's only when we come back to him that we truly find life. And the one way to prove it is to discover it for yourself. To take the bread of heaven, Jesus Christ, and live for him. And you will have food that endures to eternal life. This is one of my favorite quotes. And I want to leave it with you. Do not be afraid that your life should come to an end but rather fear that it should never have a beginning. And it begins in Jesus Christ. And it goes on as we invest ourselves in treasure in heaven. I want to finish with just telling you about a man in Abbot's Cross who's gone to glory. He was called Bert Sterling. I met him when he was 78 years of age. His wife was in a nursing home right across the road from our church building. And I was going in to visit her one day and I saw a motorbike outside and I been dressed in motorbikes, had a couple of myself and I was admiring this bike and I thought that was really lovely. And then I went in to visit Mrs. Sterling. And the man who was in visiting her, who was her husband, had a leather jacket on. I said, is that your motorbike? He said, it is. I said, you ride that bike? He said, I do, all the time. 78 years of age. His favourite pastime, he said, was stopping at the traffic lights on his bike with his visor down. He would look at the car beside him and he would put his visor up and he could see people pointing. <laughs> look at that wee wizened old man riding that motorbike. <laughs> Bert Sterling came to faith when he was 79. His wife was buried on his 80th birthday. And I never saw a man with such a hunger and thirst for God. He used to say to me on a Sunday going out of church, he would say, if you have a wee minute, would you call with me? I said, certainly. I would call around. He would say, and I don't want to keep you back. I don't want to waste your time. I said, Bert, you're not wasting my time. And he would take out a wee bit of paper. And he had six or seven questions. He'd say, these things I don't understand. Will you help me? I said, if I can, Bert, I will. And he'd have the page number in the Bible, and he would go to the Bible and he'd say, Now, what does this mean? He'd read it. And I would give him the best explanation I could. Bert Sterling, he started to do a lot of things when his wife died. I, don't, I think his wife maybe cramped his style a wee bit. <laughs> Although she allowed him to ride a motorbike, he learned to, he, he learned to, to, to drive a speedboat, he learned to fly. Uh, his next ambition, he didn't make it because he passed away, was to learn to ride a horse. Now this man was in his 80s. He said he tried to learn to scuba dive and he went to the local swimming pool and they put this heavy weight on his back. He was only a very small man, very frail. He said he fell backwards with this weight on his back and he said I was lying there like a beach turtle. <laughs> he said I couldn't move. So I think he gave up on that one. But here's the important thing. You maybe say to me, oh, you know, at my age, it's never too late. Burke Sterling crammed more into his last five years than many as a person does in 50 years. And if God gives us life through Jesus Christ, we will have that which will be ours forever. And we can invest in it. Whatever time God gives us. So let me ask you as I close. Are you working just for food that will spoil? Are you working for food that endures to eternal life? Which the Son of Man will give you. Let's pray.
Our gracious God, we thank you for your word and for the one who is the bread of life. We praise you for all that we're surrounded by and for how you provide for us and for how we lack for nothing. But our Father, we pray that as we give thanks to you for the earthly, tangible expressions of your love, that we will not work simply for food that spoils. We praise you that Jesus Christ is the bread of life, that he alone can truly satisfy our hunger, and that he is able to make us live. So, Father, will you draw us to him? Will you enable us to set our hearts upon him and love him and trust him and receive the forgiveness and salvation that he wants to give us? And day by day, in whatever way we can, work for food that will endure to eternal life. We pray in the Savior's name. Amen. Now the choir are going to sing their last piece. It's entitled Endless Praise.
sure if John was here, he would want to say thank you to you folks, and I want to do that on his behalf. Thank you very much for leading our praise and for singing those anthems. Really, really lovely and inspiring, uh, lifting our hearts to the Lord. So thank you very much. Going to sing together our final praise. I'm sorry if you're a little bit later out than you normally are. You can blame me. Um, going to sing through the darkness of the ages. And then after this, uh, there is a prayer ministry available in the church here. If you'd like somebody to pray with you about something in particular, then there will be folk available. And also tea and coffee will be served in the main hall. And you'd be very welcome to uh, join the folk there uh, in the main hall. Now we're going to sing through the darkness of the ages. May grace, mercy, and peace for God, from God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us this day and forevermore, and to your name be the praise, honor, and glory, now and always. Amen. <laughs>